everyone. Uh, my name is Evgeny, and uh, today I will today I will tell you what lessons we, uh, did we learn uh, during last two years uh, when we was developing uh, our own uh, two our own projects. One was developed in Ruby on Rails. The other one was developed in Phoenix, and both was created with a very limited amount of resources. It was a bootstrapped companies. And our, one of our main goals from the very beginning was to utilize developers' time as effective as possible. And uh, particularly in a, in a situation, in a high-risk situation, when we have a bug in production, we should be able to fix it fast you know, and uh, continue to move on with the building new features. Terribly apologize. something with the Chrome. Uh, so we will continue in Firefox. There will be an address bar. Please don't pay attention to it. <laughs> uh, so how does it start it for me? It started for me in 2015. Uh, I was leading the front-end development for uh, two projects, uh, one after another, and uh, both of them went over time and budget. Uh, Particular. Uh, and actually, it was like from 15 to 30 percent uh, over the time and budget. Uh, that was very stressful and painful experience, and especially because the the, the engineers, the team was very capable. Those, uh, that was one of the best companies in Canada. Is there there was recognized one of the best development uh, web development shops by the independent rating, and. Uh, the average rate is 150 Canadian dollars per hour for such developers. So how, how did it happen? Uh, <laughs> my first, my, I, I, I guess it's that it's because we, was, we didn't, we, we, we didn't uh, do our homework good enough. We didn't facilitate the requirements with the customers. We didn't, uh, we tried, you know, to move, move. Uh, we, we tried to figure everything on the go, and it didn't really work well enough because the domain domain was complex, and there was a lot of nuances on top of. E every day we discovered something new on top on top uh, the information that we already knew. And uh, I started I started to ask myself how how we can uh, avoid coming into that is this pitfall uh, in the future. Uh, how do we do everything right and, you know, we, we just go home in 6 p.m. and our, our clients are happy and their business is thriving. And, of course, uh, th th those project was uh, done in Ruby on Rails. And back then it was a conventional wisdom, make your controllers uh, thin and your models fat. So uh, most of the time, it, like, in, in this mindset, uh, the, thing, the, uh, the first thing that comes to your mind naturally is to figure out the data model, right? Because you have a fat model, most of, the, most of your application goes in your model. And uh, this is, the, low, uh, this is the, the most obvious place to, you know, to uh, clean up. So I, I, th I, start, I started with, uh, I started with uh, uh, digging the data modeling and uh, I saw. I thought that it 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 will be the cure, but on our next project uh, that we uh, that was about real estate renting, uh, I was proven wrong. It was it, it just it just impossible to have a precise data model for the MVP, for uh, 
for example, to model, uh, to model uh, just a normal apartment, right, with all these amenities and facilities, location, like, and uh, broker-related stuff, it will take around 30 tables. And you are just not doing MVP with, you know, uh, at, at, this, um, at, at that scale. Uh, so I, I, then I, I decided to take a step back and think, what is the model? What actually is the model? Not is the active record model, right? But just a model. And of course, it's, and, and uh, the question is very simple. Model of your domain, uh, the model that you create in your application is like a map to the territory, right? To the, it's, uh, it's a map like a territory. To the, uh, like, so sorry, your model is to the real world is like a map of the territory, right? You put something meaningful into your model. Uh, to create a reflection of your problem space. Uh, and then, uh, then, then was other Rails problems like, you know, the, the global uh, shared state in the view. Like you have a helpers that are just sharing the same namespace and they can modify the global variables. And if something is modified in one partial, you can, cannot probably know uh, for sure that it will not affect the other one. You know, just global state is just not bearable for uh, any sufficiently large application. And uh, then, uh, the most important part, where, where, how, how you, where you actually put the things, where you put your methods, where you put your logic, where you put the behavior. You cannot have a models uh, 2,000 lines long, right? Uh, if you, if you uh, actually you can, and some, pe some people do, and if you, if you ever work it with a code base that is like six or seven or 10 years old, you know how painful it is. Uh, it's just, no, nobody just want to touch it. Nobody's like, you know, just like, like a hot potato that everybody throws in other person's head. So uh, this, is the, this is the exact definition of active record pattern uh, by its inventor. Uh, and I'm sorry, not the definition. Uh, this is a description of the pattern. And the author says that active record is, can work for your application if, it's, if you are doing something very simple. Basically, it's only good for the CRUD action, create, read, update, delete, and database validation, you know, and that's it. Uh, maybe uh, maybe you, could, you can put their associations, but it's definitely not worth to put the uh, domain logic, to put the business logic to describe the behavior of the actors in the application inside the active record model. So, uh, and we had a chance to try a trailblazer. Trailblazer, trailblazer is a high, uh, a high level uh, framework for the Rails application. It was created uh, uh, in Australia by the guy whose name is Nick, and uh, his specialization is refactoring the legacy code bases. So the companies brings him in uh, to fix their old and bloated application. And uh, after a while, he came up with this concept of trailblazer that, uh, that, that encompassed his experience of refactoring bad code bases or legacy. And it was okay. We tried it. It was okay. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, you know, really, pull, really move the needle. Uh, it you can see here that it provides some kind of uh, like domain uh, and like domain reflection in the blue fi blue field, but essentially it's just an extension of Rails concepts. It's, it it tried it tried to fix the problem in a place in a, in a in a wrong place. It tried to add some technical pattern right to the Rails, but it didn't. Uh, it did. It, it will not save you. Uh, from doing a mistake, you know, of writing the something that users will not need. It will, uh, it, it, it will allow to move faster uh, when you have a problem of not understanding what you are doing. <laughs> and uh, the, other the, other, the other problem that uh, it was very hard for uh, to convince the developers to use uh, the trailblazer because, uh, again, I, it's just a set, it's, it's just a set of abstractions and you know, developers are very opinionated and said, okay, we can do our own, we don't need that. 
So he wasn't really able to get a full benefit from the Trailblazer. Also, I believe uh, for the teams who are looking to just add uh, uh, high-level architecture abstractions to their applications, Trailblazer will be a very nice option. So uh, building a complex systems, that's, we are, that's uh, what we are doing. And actually, this is the problem that computer scientists were solving since uh, the very early days. Uh, this is a quote uh, from the inventors of the first of the object-oriented paradigm. Uh, in 1961, uh, Christian Nygaard and Ole Jandal uh, invented an object-oriented paradigm to model physical reactions inside the nuclear, nuclear uh, fusion process. And uh, what they say is it became evident that no useful and consistent set of concepts existed in terms of which the structure and structure and interaction interaction in this complex system could be understood and described. Back then, uh, programs was mostly written in the procedural style. It's like PHP. You have a huge file, and you have bam 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 your function. So there is no encapsulation, no inheritance, nothing there. And it was not enough for what for what they was calling the complex system. And uh, and those systems are not even close to the complexity that we are dealing with now in typical SaaS platforms, because they didn't have a user interface in 1960, right? There was no click and point, drag and drop. Uh, there was just a program that and and they was dealing with the physical laws. Uh, they was not dealing with the social problems. They didn't. Uh, there was no ordering cookies, right? with the different integrations and payment options and uh, delivery options. The, the laws of physics are fairly static. You model them, you run the program, and you get the output. That's it. And, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's how, 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 how we are, uh, what we have, what we are left with right now. We are using the object-oriented paradigm, which was created to handle uh, much lower level of complexity that we are dealing with. And uh, the, point, the point is that if you are thinking only in terms of inheritance, encapsulation, and uh, what's the third star? It, you, 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 it, will not, it will not get you, uh, it will not uh, take you far enough. You will, edit, you will end up in the mess of code base. We need something more. So. Uh, can we call that programmers happiness? I mean, uh, the situation when, uh, you know, everything's right, uh, you are doing your job, it, it's, it's, uh, and it satisfies uh, the, 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 the social demand, the, your, your customer requirements. And uh, you're basi you basically, you, are <laughs> uh, you, have, you have time for your hobby and yourself and self-development. I I think I think yes, we can call that happiness, and uh, at least for a lack of a better word. So, are tools just enough to be in that state uh, when you are satisfied with your job, when it uh, when your job satisfies the customer, your manager, your family uh, is happy because you have time for them. Right now, we have a languages, uh, we have a frameworks. Uh, what we, what we do else to achieve that happiness, and uh, I w a small remark. And up to the second part of the talk, where where there will be a technical examples, I will use Ruby and Elixir, Phoenix and Rails interchangeably because they they share the same mindset of uh, developer happiness. So, when we are building an app. We have to ask, ask, answer two questions. What we are building and how we are building. And before writing a, a single line of code, uh, we need to answer what we are building. It's, it's actually a pretty simple process. You, are ca you capture your requirements, you create a model of what you want to do, right? You don't want to build a simulator real life. You want to uh, boil everything down to the set of meaningful concepts that you can uh, recreate or reflect in the code. And uh, then you are using the, uh, 
some specific techniques like controller, uh, MVC pattern, uh, DCI pattern, other patterns to, 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 to structure your application. And uh, during the talk, we will uh, take a look on, on both sides of it. So our study subject will be a flow mail. It's an email marketing application for a small business. And that's, a, that's important because it's very, it's, it's super simple. Like simplicity is the key. It doesn't have a lot of features. It tries, tries to do one thing good. So it will be easier to understand. Like if you see something on the screen, it, there is nothing, you know, nothing more to add to it. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a few basic concepts, right? User has a subscribers. Subscriber is a person who gave a positive consent to receive a, a newsletter. Uh, subscribers are organized in the subscription list and user can send campaigns to the subscribers. This is what I, I heard from my partner when we started to work on it. So this is basically was my, my input as the technical co-founder. Like he said, it's super simple, like all these three things and we are done. Like tomorrow you wake up a millionaire. millionaire. Uh, it, it, it was uh, in the beginning, in the December of 2016. Back, the, uh, back then, I moved from the trying to think uh, about application in terms of dat data model to the actual uh, application arg engineering framework. And two, and uh, the first one that I discovered called object-oriented software engineering. It was uh, invented, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, in the Sweden and published in, in 1996 it was used to build really complex telecom projects uh, in, North, in North Telecom, I think. And uh, it was very well through, uh, thought out. It was used mostly, it was, yeah, it, 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 it was used for something that author created, author call it, uh, uh, not the enterprise, but the, uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, like industrial, yes, industrial. It, it was used for industrial software, not the blogs, not the e-commerce, but industrial software, you know. Industrial grade systems where, where which can be used by the military, by the government, uh, which has a, a huge requirements towards stability and reliability. And uh, he argued that to build a good system, you need to have a four models. You, f you need to have a requirements model which, ca which, will, uh, which will be built upon the requirements specifications that will be given to you, right? It will just describe, create this map of the real world. And then uh, it will include the use cases. Use case is the description of the action from beginning till the very end. Uh, just to give an example, uh, for example, subscription, right? You enter your email, uh, you click sign up, you enter email, password, click sign up, and that's, that is the, start, the beginning of use case. The data is sent to server, uh, the data is being interpreted, the necessary actions are carried out, like creation of database records, setting up an, uh, some kind of association, sending and confirmation email, et cetera, et cetera. So use case will describe something from end to end. Then uh, uh, there is an interface description and not a user interface description, but a description of uh, objects involved uh, in this uh, use cases. And uh, something that you, and he put a little, a really small emph emphasis on the problem domain, problem domain model. It means that he didn't actually much care about the, the, the real, you know, the real life, real context uh, in the problem. He said, you just, you just have in requirements and you don't need to validate if those requirements are correct. You just create use cases, uh, you describe them in uh, objects in the analysis model, you refine those objects to the particular, you know, uh, particular uh, language concepts, like uh, classes, for example, in design model, and then you implement it. On the contrary, 10 years after, in 2006, another concept came out which was called domain-driven design. And the author argued that you can get away with the two models, with the analysis model and implementation. So he said that you can squash first three models into one and you can tackle a, co 
any level of complexity with only one model. So what, uh, what, enable, what can enable the developers to have the minimum required amount of documentation and you know, homework of, and preparation and uh, work on applications with any level of complexity. So actually, actually, it turned out that those two uh, approaches, they share uh, this idea. And in uh, OOSE, it's called a traceability. It means that if you have something in, require, in requirements model, it, uh, then you will have same entity in the implementation, and this entity should be traceable through all, all the model. You cannot call uh, an entity a subscriber, for example, in requirements model, and call it e email receiver in the design model. You should be able to, to, to trace you know, the evolution or description of the entity through all the models. And uh, what did DDD say about that? Uh, it's, it actually just carried away that concept a little bit farther. Uh, let me explain it. So every time you talk, you talk with a customer or a stakeholder or with your friend, uh, which come to you and say, I, hey, I have a great idea. Let's build a startup and tomorrow you will wake up a millionaire. He will tell you the very specific part of, of his idea, the one that's market wide. And uh, this is usually th his core understanding of what should be built. But uh, trust me, he thought about it a lot and he has a much deeper context in his idea. There are many, many de details in his head that he will just not spit out on you immediately because he cares only about the core. It's, uh, uh, or if, 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 you know, if it's a sneaky client and he don't want to uh, tell his trade secrets, he will obfuscate it in a way, you know, so you, you won't uh, steal his idea and implement, implement by yourself. So there is always a communicated part, then, and then there is untold and unknown. And uh, untold is so-called known unknown. It's something that you can clarify during the conversation. And uh, unknown is unknown unknown. It's something that is not yet even on the horizon. It, it will come up just, oh, you know what? We need to do it different way because of this and that. It's something that will just pop up at uh, some specific moment. So uh, in our example, uh, communicated thing was, uh, subscribers should receive campaigns from users. And that told, campaigns will be sent to the subscription list. What does it mean? Uh, for example, you have uh, 10,000 subscribers, right? You will not click each subscriber uh, you know, mark each subscriber that you want to send an email. You will have a sub an abstraction called subscription list that will group uh, the subscribers and you will send campaigns to the subscribers, right? It, it, to figure out, it, it took like 15 minutes. I, I just asked it how we will send the campaigns. Should campaigns operate on the subscribers level or on the subscription list? And we figured out it immediately. The real unknown thing that was the automations. And automation is, is kind of a reverse of campaign. Campaign is uh, something that will be sent on particular date, right? You say, uh, for example, uh, on, uh, before the Lunar New Year, right? You, you are sending a promotion or you congratulate your customers. And automation is that happens something that happens after specific amount of time was passed. For example, one month after registration, you send a promotion to your subscriber like to engage the, the purchase or trade. That thing was unknown. Uh, so let me, let, let, let me give you a very fast uh, chess analogy. Uh, in each project, you when you're starting a project, you have a starting arrangement. Uh, you have a figures, uh, which are basically implementation patterns that uh, all of us know, know very well. It's for example, uh, sign up with the email and password, uh, recover your password, etc. Then you have rules. How those patterns are combined? You can think uh, it's about like walls in the maze, right? It's it's how you combine those patterns and you build the application. And then there is a board. The board is where everything of those things happens. And the customer gives you a board, or your stakeholder, or the person who know about the project gives you a board. So if you don't 
understand your problem uh, space. You don't have a board. You don't. You don't have a space to play. You don't have an area when you can up, uh, for applicate applying those uh, those patterns. So and how we how we can uh, how we can uh, be how we can prepare for the unknown stuff. Uh, actually, it's uh, actually uh, if you think about uh, what we are doing, like all all of our applications have same things, right? Uh, that carry it from application to application, same registration, right? But it's a little bit different on each of each of the website. Somewhere you can register with uh, email, somewhere with the uh, SMS message, and this is a pattern. And uh, when you are speaking with the people about the software, about with the stakeholders, they will have those patterns in their uh, language. And uh, if you can recognize the patterns that they are using in their language, uh, it will be the real key to building an application uh, that will be change positive, as Tim Riley said. Because you will know the, what happens in your application, and you will be able to give it a real structure. For example, and, uh, and uh, uh, every time you have a naming problem or internal collision, you can, uh, you can go, you can revert to the language, you know, just normal spoken language, and uh, figure out the problem. And if you pay attention to that conversation, you will hear uh, the exact words and phrases that will that should be present in your code base. You know this traceability features, right? You speak with a person about the software, and he give you names and concepts and patterns, and those things should be present in your code base. In DDD, it's called ubiquitous language. This is the very feature that will enable you uh, to build an application that uh, will not give you gray hair. Uh, if you look at my head, I have a lot. So I'm here to save you some. Uh, so yeah, and uh, anytime you have a naming problem, it's a problem not of not being, of not understanding your domain problem enough, domain, space, uh, domain area enough. And having a collision is the same. So what is a pattern? Pattern is an activity which repeats itself over and over again, always appearing each time in a slightly different manifestation. Or a little uh, deeper uh, definition is each pattern is the rule which describes what you have to do to generate an entity which it defines. It's simple recursion. And an example of the pattern, uh, it's a subscription list creation. Uh, we have it in a different places in Flowmail. So you can basically create it uh, manually just by inputting the uh, subscription list name. Or you can create it on the go when you are importing the subscribers. You are just, uh, add, uh, you, just you, you will just have to type a new uh, subscription list name and all subscribers will be imported in that subscription list. And each time I talk it to John, my partner, uh, and he, you know, he uses template of subs subscription list creation. I should have recognized that, that pattern because it's recurring in different variations over and over again across our application. And then I can think, okay, I can build abstraction that will create uh, a subscription list. And then I can, I can think about behavior of the application, how I use this pattern in the different parts of our application. So, uh, that will enable, you know, like, uh, also, also patterns uh, can, be, uh, can create a hierarchy. You know, the small, the small patterns uh, can be combined in the bigger patterns. For example, subscription list creation and consent period. Uh, consent period is a period when a subscriber is ready to receive your marketing emails. Because uh, we are uh, castle, we are castle uh, Canadian anti-spam legislation complaint, uh, we cannot send an emails over two years uh, if there was no uh, positive consent about it. So uh, there is two patterns: uh, 
you subscriber have a consent period and there is a subscription list uh, creation that can that that are parts that constitutes the bigger patterns like subscri uh, the subscription page uh, and where where person can subscribe by himself and subscribers import. So core takeaway is language, just normal spoken language, is a bridge between the problem space and solution space. It's the DNA of every project. Everything you need to know is about your project, is not the framework you are building in it. It's not Rails, it's not jQuery, it's not a Phoenix. It's what other people, the stakeholder is, talk, is telling you. And it's your uh, biggest and primary responsibility as a problem solver to understand what is what is uh, what he is talking about, and uh, describe it and implement it in a, in the technology of your choice, in a way that it will survive the uh, time check, the real world check. So what and, and that brings us to the definition of software architecture. So software architecture is a way to comb combine variations and commonalities in a way that is less expensive to change. I hope it makes sense. So, of course, there is an other side to it. Don't overdo it. Model only what is relevant. Like it takes a practice. It will not happen immediately, but it's it's a mind shift. It's a just it it doesn't takes a lot from you. It's just uh, a, a small small change in, in your mind view how you look at the applications. You know the Buddhists say that to to get an enlightenment, it's enough a space between two thoughts. So. It's just it's just a slight shift on how you approach the customer or or the client or whoever or your project manager that can take you really far away. And of course, each feature should have a business value. If 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 you're building something that doesn't have a business value, it's uh, not an innovation. It's just uh, something that uh, you are doing for yourself. And relying on language on ubiquitous language that is uh, presented uh, in the communications between you and non-developers and your code base. You know, you, you don't have to do a translation between your code base and, and uh, the terms that you are communicate with. It can give you a real social dynamism. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if somebody tells you, I want to do uh, like a scooter delivery, right? It's uh, because something in society allows us to do it. Uh, something in society changed it and uh, he has a new business requirement. And only, only uh, by, uh, it's the, the only way to follow it is to focus uh, on modeling uh, what is necessary using the, the, the ubiquitous language. So, implementation. Uh, we all are working with uh, MVC frameworks, right? And MVC's uh, core idea is give user an uh, illusion that he's doing, his, that his memory is extension of computer memory, that there is a real button somewhere in that box that he clicks, right? <laughs> the, uh, it's, 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 it abstracts zeros and uh, zeros and ones. So it doesn't, it, 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 it's a GUI pattern, it will not, solve your problem of domain modeling. You cannot uh, model complex domain complex enough, you know, that is just, that is something bigger than HTTP request with just an MVC. You have to have something more in your toolkit. So, uh, capturing the behavior. This is the biggest problem of object-oriented development is that uh, people don't know where to put uh, their behavior. In the beginning, uh, the idea was that if you have a small methods, right, in the uh, properly encapsulated classes, the biggest, the big behavior will appear by itself. The, the, the life showed that it's just not true. So we have, we have to have an orchestration layer. And when you're building an orchestration layer, you really want to structure, to slice your applications vertically. You don't want to have a, uh, a lot of horizontal links between your objects. Right, you have an use case and you have operations that compose that use case. You don't want to use case to call another use case. It will entangle the, pro uh, the uh, project and mess up your code base. 
So the way you are you divide uh, uh, the on the top of per pure pyramid of uh, modeling your application is a bounded context, and bounded context is the linguistic boundary uh, between application part, which core property is to is the ability to adapt to its own processes. Uh, for example, in Flow Mail we have admin, newsletter, billing, notifications, and newsletter queue bounded, uh, bounded context. And uh, for example, uh, the, the word subscription, right? In newsletter con bounded context, it means a person that uh, gave a positive consent to receive uh, emails. And uh, in the billing context, it's an agreement to systematically pay for a service. So it's different folders with, uh, with concepts uh, that have the same name, subscription, have a, having a different meaning in certain context. Uh, by the way, the newsletter context, uh, we, f we, uh, we found uh, the clue how to name it in the, in the interface that was you know, discussed. We didn't know that it will be newsletter in the beginning. So Phoenix context are not bound in context. Uh, if you are programming in Phoenix, they have this idea of context. It's just their own invention. Similar to Rails way is there is an emerging Phoenix way. Uh, because a bonded context spans uh, from the application to the persistence level. And uh, Phoenix contents, uh, context are mostly concerned with uh, persistence. So uh, they are more, they are they are a little bit more similar to the aggregate, a consistency and transaction border around the cluster of entities which can, uh, which can break domain invariant when updated separately. For example, the, the order. Uh, when you are updating an order, you want to update order and line items. And line items is a part of the order aggregate because, for example, if you update on order price without updating, sorry, update line items without updating order, you can break a domain invariant, which is uh, or, uh, the, the total on order should equal the sum of the prices on the line item. You add the line items, uh, order total is not updated, boom, uh, you are done. Uh, and uh, aggregate has a, so and aggregate has a root, right? It's a cluster which, which has a root, and nothing can, nothing outside of the cluster can touch nothing inside. This is what uh, Phoenix context are looks uh, look like to me at least. Uh, yeah, they're concerned by by uh, about persistence. So this is how we model it. We had a user folder with uh, uh, mailer with uh, operations, you know, check that are composable and that can be used in the uh, use cases. Then we have query files that uh, encapsulated our SQL queries. They always had a schema in the user X and validator which had a domain, uh, business domain validations. Can it really work? Unfortunately, the for very simple cases. Uh, we, we here you can see a mistake of grouping unrelated entities into sing uh, un under the user umbrella, newsletter settings and uh, notification settings. Uh, this, this, this was mistakes that we did, and I, I encourage you uh, to not to not follow that pattern. I will explain it on the next slide. Uh, it's this this is how it can look in the Phoenix 1.3 context. So when you are modeling your uh, application, never let URLs data model on user interface influence your design decisions. Those stuff are on the different abstraction layer. And a level, and it ju just don't do it. You will suffer a lot. So uh, we ended up. Is there one more slide? Okay. So uh, <laughs> so um, this was a breaking point for us. We had we had this you know like accounts folder that contained contained mul multiple entities. Then we had an admin subdomain uh, and uh, container containers that mixed multiple entities and some shared folder, obviously. And uh, subscription fo folders that grouped the concept by relatedness, which was the first step in the right direction to get the out of the mess that we created. Uh, basically, uh, the second rule of a sump is you have, if when, when you are designing your application, you know, uh, you, should you should stay on the 
same level of abstraction all the time. Here is how it should like. If there should be admin billing newsletter, blah, 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 folder. Sorry, I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, and uh, here is how it will look like in Phoenix point three. Uh, I think I think uh, on the right you will see you are seeing how it will uh, how the, the appropriate structure that we are most contained with right now. Uh, there is a user entity uh, which which has will have aggregate basically a context module in terms of Phoenix uh, one point three operations services which is which are long time running processes and use cases which models an interaction from uh, beginning till end. Uh, also, you can model the subdomains as separate applications under Umbrella app. Here you can see that subdomain, uh, the bounded context, spi uh, spans from the persistence till the interface layer. So you can have a controllers and views in your Umbrella applications. And uh, in closing, I want to say that uh, our world is full of patterns. The idea of patterns came up from the architecture. And if you look uh, at your city wet where you're living it, you will notice a lot of patterns, uh, like uh, how the streets are organized, how parks are organized. And just pay attention to what feelings uh, it brings in you when you are traveling around the city. Like how the patterns of the city shape your feeling and shape your mind. Then you can use the same analogy in software. How applying software patterns can shape the space where users are living. Uh, we don't have time. <laughs> So uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, the coupon for the 1,000 subscribers, uh, which you can use on Flowmail. Uh, thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions uh, if you have uh, later on.